<clears throat> okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you for coming today. And I want to thank uh, Joanna for inviting me. Uh, and for those of you um, uh, uh, for coming out. Um, again, it, it, she kind of already said it, but I did my dissertation work actually under uh, Joanna Quinn. Um, and I am currently teaching uh, a course in the, the Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction. So the title of my talk uh, today is Thinking Beyond the you know, Transition in Transitional Justice. But really it should, <laughs> this isn't a cop out, but it really should be why we should think beyond the transition in transitional justice. Um, so I want to be clear that I, I perhaps haven't been able to think beyond the transition uh, in transitional justice. I just think we need to have the conversation or at least open the conversation up. So what I'm really interested in, what my dissertation really uh, focuses on is the way we theorize in transitional justice. So I came to transitional justice uh, via an examination of liberal peace building in Bosnia. Additionally, I was growing increasingly interested in international human rights as a result of uh, starting to teach courses in human rights, and in particular, the prioritization of civil and political rights over economic and social rights. At that time, there, has, or there had already been a flood of articles criticizing liberal peace building in countries like Bosnia, Rwanda, East Timor for being too focused on civil and political rights at the expense of economic and social rights. Yet what I found interesting was that transitional justice remained relatively insulated from these criticisms. So I wanted to understand the relationship between liberal peace building which combines the construction of liberal democratic institutions and the establishment of free market capitalism and transitional justice. So this is kind of the starting point for thinking about transitional justice. Now my intent, I think, as probably lots of uh, uh, graduate students was to really kind of critical, I've probably just written, uh, uh, read a lot of uh, Marx. Um, so my intent was to show how transitional justice had become the handmaiden to liberal peace building and global capitalism. In doing so, I hope to show the fundamental connection between the two, at least, at least since the 1990s, thereby opening transitional justice up to the same critiques regarding the prioritization of civil and political rights over economic and social rights that were being leveled against liberal peace building by scholars like Oliver Richmond and David Chandler. By the time I started rolling, I was in good company perhaps a good and a bad thing. Uh, scholars like Simon Robbins and Zenaida Miller were publishing wonderful artic articles arguing that the prioritization of rights is symptomatic of the international community's desire to promote free market capitalism in formerly warring countries. The response, I think what was quite interesting, the response by many more mainstream transitional justice scholars was that the attempt to incorporate social and economic injustices was merely a watering down of a field that was certainly strongly rooted in the liberal tradition, which focused on the first generation rights, that is the civil and political rights. Now, as all dissertations go, my own work took some twists and turns. And while I was still interested or still inspired by this notion that we must undermine the dominance of political and civil rights, I took a greater interest in exploring the questions of justice more abstractly. Now, I must say, I always had the intent of returning to this discussion, of uh, you know, returning to this, uh, this uh, prioritization of rights, but I, I recognized, well, one, I recognized that other people were saying similar things, um, and that I need, maybe needed to dig deeper, or at least I needed to equip myself with some theoretical tools uh, to challenge this. Okay, so I, I looked at certain, or I started to look at justice, justice more abstractly. While there is no right way to pursue justice, the international community, it was clear, had coalesced around a series of preferred options, including criminal trials, truth and reconciliation commissions, and reparations, as well as lustration, uh, vetting, and some other tools. Now, while each mechanism of justice is rooted in a different paradigm of justice, retributive, restorative, and reparative, in the hands of many transitional justice scholars, 
they seem to be theorized in a way that contributes to the goal of the transition to liberal democracy. In other words, each paradigm of justice had a very uh, uh, specific and very different history um, that brought them to the present time. But when transitional justice scholars took them, they seemed to take them and make them work for uh, their goals. Indeed, democracy promotion figures prominently in the theorization of, in the field of transitional justice. And I think this is nowhere clearer than in the writings of Rudy Titel. So we just finished a, a grad class where we started to uh, dig into Rudy Titel. And so I think, and, and uh, uh, Joanne and I have had some debates about this, but I feel that Rudy Titel is, is a central figure in transitional justice um, and, and really sets the stage for how we theorize about uh, transitional justice. In her book titled uh, Transitional Justice, Titel suggests that while each mechanism, trials, truth and, commission, uh, excuse me, truth and reconcili reconciliation commissions and reparations, while each mechanism approaches the question of justice in a unique way, they are united in their capacity to bridge the divide between the old and new regime. Ultimately, Titel argues that we must think of transitional justice or transitional justice mechanisms, whether criminal prosecutions or truth commissions, as, quote, secular sanctification of the rituals and symbols of political passage a passage that sees the society transform from an illiberal regime where violations took place to a liberal regime built upon juridical discourse of rights and responsibilities and the delimiting of state power. Today, I think this transition to liberal democracy is taken as common sense in the field. And I think this is no clearer than in the emerging quantitative literature in the field. For many scholars, the introduction of quantitative research signals a maturing of the field. For example, one argues that this is the natural progression in the development of the field of transitional justice, a quote by Eric Wiebelhaus Brahm. Importantly, in this quantitative analyses or in these quantitative analyses, democracy and liberal human rights measures are consistently used as indicators of success in these studies. In one study, the adoption of these indicators is justified by the authors when they say scholars and policymakers share an expectation that transitional justice should strengthen democracy and improve human rights. And really, if we begin to dig into these measures, these indicators of success that they use to evaluate transitional justice, we can see that they use uh, different democracy scores um, drawn largely from Freedom House and others. And they use uh, different or various human rights scores, but the, the human rights scores, the, these indicators that they use, are always focused on civil and political rights. So it's very clear what we are using to evaluate transitional justice or what uh, these quantitative studies are using to evaluate transitional justice. Okay, so what is my concern? In this light, I think trials, truth commissions, reparations, are more than just mechanisms of justice, but rituals which reaffirm, reaffirm the importance of liberal democratic state. And one could argue the accompanying capitalist relations which fundamentally depend on the establishment of civil and political rights. In other words, we tend to think of justice in a way that makes it subservient to the transition. Central to the field of transitional justice has been an ongoing debate around what I call the justice question. What is justice? What are the effects of justice? What form does, just, ju excuse me, does justice take? These questions have been the motor propelling transitional justice forward from its focus on retributive justice through criminal prosecutions to its eventual incorporation of restorative justice and reparative justice with the recognition of the importance of truth and reconciliation commissions and reparations. Yet, while the justice question has been, excuse me, while the justice question has garnered considerable attention, very little focus, I think, has been placed on what I call the transition question. And in particular, what is implied by a transition 
how is justice impacted or how is justice structured by this transition? Remember, I'm at this point still thinking about our theory about transitional justice. So I have to be clear that I'm not necessarily digging into the application just yet. I'm, I'm still focused on how we, and I mean we largely in the West, are theorizing about transitional justice. So I want to take the conversation from the justice question to the transition question. What is implied by the transition? And more importantly, how is justice structured by the transition? The dominant theories in transitional justice view justice as working towards the achievement of liberal democracy and human rights, no doubt about it. Scholars in the field of transitional justice, however, have failed to interrogate these concepts, choosing instead to treat liberalism, democracy, and liberal democracy as universal ideals. The desire to push transitional justice to include economic and social rights certainly is still driving my work. But I realized when I returned to that question that this was not going far enough. In other words, incorporating social and economic rights was not going far enough in the face of this overpowering structuring of the idea of justice by the transition. And what I believed, or what I started to believe, was that we needed a more thorough or radical rethinking of how our thinking about the transition shapes justice in transitional justice. In other words, the task at hand is not about putting forward another expression of justice, one that would recognize economic and social rights. Rather, we must call attention to the way justice has had to conform or mold itself to the transition narrative in order to caution against the closure of justice around any single expression of justice, whether that be retributive, restorative, reparative, whether that be one that incorporates civil and political rights or incorporates civil and political rights and economic and social rights. In the end, we are still enclosing justice around a, a very specific definition that I think we need to keep open. For as soon as we identify the goals of justice, things like democracy and liberal human rights, we enclose it in a wall and define what is and what is not worthy of being identified as justice, thereby perpetuating domination in our theories. In order to maintain openness, I argue that we must have the intellectual space to challenge the canonization of any single theory. Now, I suggest various tools or ways to think about transitional justice to challenge this, but I'll focus on one of them today. To be certain, the fact is that the contested nature of justice is recognized in the field. We have actually from a very early on recognized that, na or that justice means lots of things to different people. In fact, uh, Harvey Weinstein and Eric Stover uh, claim this uh, quite early on. But despite this, the theories of transitional justice continue to privilege certain vocabularies or expressions of justice over others, including liberal vocabularies like human rights, uh, liberal democracy, so on and so forth. But these, or this issue, I think, perhaps, is just a symptom of a more fundamental problem. That is, seeing conflict as something that can be resolved once and for all. Hence the term transitional justice. So to attack this, to attack the structuring of justice, I, one of the tools I look at in my dissertation is to go after the assumptions around conflict. Because perhaps the way we think of conflict allows us to think about uh, uh, transitional justice in this particular way. Now these critiques, while pertinent within the field of transitional justice, highlight a significant assumption in the field that the right kind of justice, or excuse me, that with the right kind of justice, we can progress to a state of existence that no longer requires justice. In other words, transi transitional justice implies finality, a final, a final endpoint. So the right kind of justice will lead us out of transition. And I think, if I can stop for a moment, I think it's very hard to think of transitional justice as something that doesn't transition to something else. Of course, this is implied in the very name, in the very label of our field. Such a view 
maintains the assumption that all societies are transitioning or progressing towards a final endpoint. Okay, so the idea that transitional justice and the societies in which it operates is advancing towards a final endpoint is problematic, I think, for four reasons. First, it fundamentally structures our actions. That is, once we have set our sights on an ideal endpoint, right, the, the coming out of conflict, we tend to close ourselves off to all other options except those that will contribute to this final endpoint. Second, setting a final endpoint, of course, closes the door on alternative endpoints. Third, setting a final endpoint, especially if it relates to justice, suggests a certain level of permanency that oversimplifies the complexity of life, especially life in, in uh, post-conflict or conflict societies. In societies emerging from conflict, such an assumption suggests that the quantity of justice needed for, excuse me, this quantity of justice needed for societies emerging from conflict can be measured in doses. A dose of retributive, a dose of restorative, therefore are viewed as sufficient to heal society. Finally, to assert that we are advancing towards a final endpoint opens the door to the most powerful to decide what that endpoint is going to look like. It does not maintain the flexibility that is arguably necessary in states emerging from conflict. Indeed, the site of transition is bombarded by a multitude of actors and ideas. To close this site off, or to close this site at all, to a, uh, but to a select few ideas, becomes a point of contention, I think, on the ground. In other words, to do so is to deny the inextricable conflict in every free society. Our ability to think about justice in the service of the transition fundamentally depends on the assumption that conflict is something that can be resolved. But what if we tried on for size the idea that conflict is interminable, never ending? Would this force us to reconsider justice? It would, at the very least, force us to be cautious about ever closing justice. That is saying, justice is done, move on. Now, why is this important? Well, whether transitioning from conflict or from authoritarian rule, societies that adopt transitional justice mechanisms are observably, go observably going through significant societal transformation. These societies become a point of intersection of various forces, both international and national, each of their own contending ideas, or excuse me, each with their own contending ideas of what we are transitioning to and the best way to get there. Thus, when we speak of transitional justice, we are always referring to a site of deep contestation where the stakes are quite high, that is peace. To try to hold justice and its goals to a final definition limits its capacity to respond to the needs of survivors. In other words, justice must remain open to reinterpretation for it to maintain its relevance in post-conflict societies. Okay, I wasn't sure how much time I'd have, so to kind of concretize these ideas, I, I thought I'd put forward a case. Now, I won't go into the details of the case, but I think all of us are probably quite familiar with South Africa. Now, in the case of South Africa, we had a, a, of course, they had, of course, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and, and part of the, the, uh, the process of transitional justice were uh, uh, reparations to be paid out. Now, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, uh, went on, and the reparations uh, were eventually paid out, um, but with uh, a lot of, of uh, pushback and uh, with the survivors uh, having to fight for them, really. And in the end, uh, what was promised to them in the report wasn't actually what was given out um, in, finally in 2003. Now, of particular concern for my work has been the government's rhetoric regarding reparations. According to David Backer, despite the enrichment of political elites since the transition from apartheid, the then President Theo Thabo Mbeki, uh, among others, have opposed reparations, arguing that the liberation movement was not 
fought for money and that reparations are tantamount to putting a price on losses that are fundamentally irreparable. And I think this is interesting, and I'm not alone in pointing this out. Uh, others uh, suggest that the government has actually been quite dismissive of those who want reparations or those who pushed for more reparations, labeling them as opportunistic and uh, unrepresentative. Now, the contested issue of reparations in South Africa suggests, suggests excuse me, I think, a great deal of caution. In particular, what I think is interesting is that in South Africa, they had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I think for many people, this spoke to their understanding of justice. Whether or not it was a complete form of justice is, is a different discussion. But there are many who believed that this was not justice for them, and they wanted other forms of justice. But the reality, I think, is what has gone on is that the government in South Africa has said justice is done, we are now moving forward. And those of you who are continuing to call for, for justice are in the wrong. And I think this, is, uh, or this speaks to what I'm talking about here. Our need or uh, the necessity of our theories to close transitional justice, to have an, a final endpoint, allows for leaders, I think, to be able to, to set an end date and then move on. But the reality is that it leaves out voices. And in fact, it doesn't just leave them out, it actually provides an ethical dimension in that those voices who do not feel that justice has been had are now in the wrong. They should just get over it. I, I had a class um, I taught yesterday uh, on slavery, and, and I was amazed by uh, individuals who said they should just get over it. Now, of course, we haven't really had justice uh, in, in uh, the United States just yet, um, but I think that same dynamic is what uh, uh, can go on uh, and what has gone on in South Africa, the, the calls to just get over it. But if we see conflict not as something that ends and we move forward, but as interminable, as ongoing, as always present, I think it opens, or at least it forces us to, uh, to uh, think of justice as something that will probably need to be maintained and something that uh, um, uh, will not be uh, uh, just simply in our past. Um, and I think, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not... I think what the realization I came to in my dissertation is that I can't say what justice is. And that's what I was trying to do early on. I was trying to assert what justice is. Justice for me, of course, was economic and social uh, rights, was the, the you know, addressing structural injustices. But the reality is that I do not know what justice is. And I'm not all... Uh, us in, in the West, uh, you know, who make up a great deal of transitional justice, uh, the field of transitional justice, really don't know what justice is. Uh, we can certainly put forward mechanisms, uh, we can put forward uh, ways to approach justice, but I think when our theories close justice around definite definitions, we are fundamentally uh, perpetuating uh, injustices in our theories itself. And so that's why I chose this, this idea that if we see conflict as interminable, as ongoing, it is actually um, perhaps a slap in the face, I think, for transitional justice scholars to remind them that you can't do that, that, uh, that uh, we need to think about these things in a way that allows for the ongoing discussion, the, the conversation uh, to remain open. Thanks.